Hi everybody and welcome back to Talk Gnosis. I'm Father Tony. Jonathan Stewart is with me and so again is Dr. James McGrath from Butler University. We're talking about his new book, Theology and Science Fiction. Welcome back, Dr. McGrath. Thanks for having me back and thanks for being interested in continuing to talk about this subject. Um, <laughs> I, think it's, I think it's worthy of lots of ongoing conversations. Um, yeah, all the time. I'm expecting that uh, we'll, we'll have... Uh, we'll have more things to talk about uh, over the course of these podcasts and video casts, and uh, we're going to have time to fit in. Oh, but, sure, always. But what, but I feel that way you... about the book. It's 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 right. it's really just sort of skimming the surface and introducing and kind of, it's a get your feet wet kind of book and saying, you know, there's this whole wider world. Dive in. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, let's dive in. So last time we ended off talking about um, kind of the Matrix and some uh, some ideas of of the. The science fiction of the creator of the world being, you know, less uh, less than perfect or malevolent uh, at worst. Um, you mentioned that uh, when when they wake up in the Matrix, it's not necessarily a better situation for them, right? Like the world they had been in was relatively comfortable, you know, almost like a Garden of Eden kind of a situation. Um, the only thing, uh, you know, like that was spurring them on to a really attempt to wake up to the real world was some kind of nagging feeling that it was, you know, the world was incorrect or, or fake or something like that. Um, the the analogy I often use is the, the only reason why an oyster will create a pearl is because there is some kind of irritant, like there's something that's bothering it. And so it yeah. it is spurned to create something beautiful out of that. Um, but then when they wake up in from the Matrix, they're in a, essentially an awful... Um, robot place, <laughs> and uh, and then they have to like flee quickly to a cave, and so uh, you know not really a, a fantastic situation. Um, however, that's not the end of the story, though. I mean, if you uh, if you take the other two movies into account, right? Neo does go on to then transcend both worlds and mm -hmm. to return to his rightful place of whatever that is, and that is of course, open to interpretation for, uh, <laughs> for everybody. So, um, so I think it still works. I think you have to do an extra step, but, uh, you know. Yeah, well, I, I think, yeah, one of the things I want to mention is that, you know, one of the, one of the famous uh, elements, and it, it, it seems to have been a kind of standalone thing that was incorporated into the uh, Acts of Thomas, but uh, the Hymn of the Pearl mm -hmm. came to mind, as you mentioned, you know, the oyster producing the pearl. Yes. And you know, I think we need a new hymn of the pearl or a new take on the hymn of the pearl, where essentially you know the revealer you know serves as sort of an irritant. Right? Yeah. Uh, you know, there's there's a whole take on that that's not part of that tradition. But well, I think we have I one. I uh, have right? you seen? Um, oh gosh, now what? My mind is blank. Guillermo del Toro, um, the labyrinth. The labyrinth. Uh, no, actually, I haven't. Is that uh, what it's called? Oh, Pan's Labyrinth. Pan's Labyrinth, yeah. thank Pan's you. Pan's Labyrinth, right. Yeah, um, that is, I believe, kind of a straight-up retelling of the Hymn of the Pearl. Um, but, yeah, the, uh, the, the um, Pan figure, the, the kind of hierophant, if you will, is, um, is obnoxious. <laughs> <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah, and as an educator, I think that, you know, um, bringing truth and being obnoxious uh, have to intersect at least <laughs> something, right? Yeah. Uh, I mean, that may be a comforting story I tell myself, right? But, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, I think one of the interesting things in the Matrix movies is, you know, it's a question that also comes up in, you know, Star Trek, for instance, mm. right? Uh, they occasionally find Edenic or supposedly Edenic worlds. Yeah. And they're not a place that you want to stay, mm. right? Um, and so something that the Matrix and Star Trek converge on is this idea that, we're not made for Eden, right? And of course, in in the Gnostic tradition, very often Eden is this, you know, part of this imperfect world, mm -hmm. right? The serpent oftentimes is the one that's a positive figure revealing truth, right? That uh, the the creator wants to keep them keep from them. But in the Matrix movie, we have this idea that the first Matrix was was perfect, right? Everything was you know as great as it could be, yeah. and human minds rejected that. Mm -hmm. And so then they replicated the you know the the end of the twentieth century, right? Because <laughs> that that we could that the human mind would accept, right? Right. Uh, but with a little bit of a nagging feeling, but also apparently, right, with 
the occasional exception, right? There were people um, in some stories that, you know, spontaneously awoke, but mostly you needed someone to come from the world above yeah. and to make you aware of the truth that was niggling in your mind, but you couldn't put your finger on. Right. And then, of course, to actually, you know, do the tracking thing and locate you. And so, again, you have a kind of science, a quasi-scientific take on these elements from the spiritual tradition. Right, right. The enemy uh, of, uh, of, of Gnosis isn't ignorance, really. Well, it is, but it's ignorance born out of a kind of comfortable mediocrity where everything's fine and you don't really care. You know, like, it, yeah. you're not spurred on to look for anything deeper and you know, things, are, things are pretty okay. And I think that's why we're seeing such a resurgence in interest in Gnosticism these days. Yeah, and and there's there's a ship called the Gnosis. That's right. right. Make sure we mention that, mm -hmm. right? It gets mentioned in, um, I want to say it's in the second it's movie. It's in the second one, yeah. And one of the things we also learn is that, in fact, it's not just people who find the Matrix more comfortable and want to go back into it, right? Like Cypher, mm -hmm. uh, who... You know, are resisting the gnosis, right? The truth that's more difficult. But there's a sense in which the artificial intelligences also are, right? Yeah. By maintaining the status quo, so that you know humans are given the opportunity to, you know, they're, they're plugged in the matrix. They're also given an opportunity to rebel under these controlled conditions. Mm -hmm. And then you do the whole reset thing, and it starts all over. And so, finding a way to achieve peace becomes, you know, it's it's the harder option. And so they're kind of settling for less as well. Mm -hmm. And so there are all these fascinating ways in which the Matrix is both you know, Gnostic at very fundamental levels, as well as superficial symbolic ones, but also is kind of subversive in that, you know, well, you know, it's really raising the question, which, of course, some of the classic Gnostic myths also did with the idea of the redemption of Sophia, who kind of inadvertently gives birth to the material world indirectly. Um, and then is kind of welcomed back into the pleroma. And so the question of, you know, can these creations of ours, who then enslaved us and are now malevolent, actually themselves be redeemed? You know, and we all live happily ever after. Not because you just simply wake up and are in this better world, but because of a, an, a more complex process of redemption, which itself is interesting and has, you know, Christian and Gnostic um, connections that one could explore. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's why I, too, defend the, um, the, the sort of in our last segment, we talked about how a lot of people didn't like the second and third Matrix movies. And I like the third one quite a bit because it is so ambiguous, confusing, yeah. and doesn't have a clear good guy, bad guy, this is what happened, this is what this means, which I, I think is pretty sophisticated for, you know, a multi-million dollar movie that already has you know, some, some different layers going on. Um, and, and to clarify, too, like, the you, you know, we kind of talk about sometimes, particularly nerds like myself <laughs> we will we will see a sci-fi work and see gnostic beams into it and some of those might be conscious or subconscious or maybe i'm just reading them in there or they have similarities but the creators of the matrix are are definitely familiar with gnostic sources and are deliberately putting these themes in um though i'd maybe argue they're more familiar with grant morrison and uh 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 Phil K. Dick than they are of Nag Hammadi, but still they are, you know, deliberately doing this where some of the other Gnostic sci-fi out there, it might be subconscious or coincidental or a lining up of themes. Um, also, this is less of a question, but a, but a quick story going back to our, our previous uh, segment. The, of course, for me, The Matrix is quite a recent movie, but the first one came out 18 years ago? It, did uh, it come out in 99? 98? 99? Maybe. 98? So... So I, I've been interested in Gnosticism for a while, so fortunately I was just able to say, you know, like the Matrix, and right. to use it to explain yeah. to people. Now when I say that to people, they're like, the what now? I'm like, oh. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> well, we were talking about Star Trek, you know, so right. I mean, yeah. really yeah. digging back, right? Oh, uh, that movie with Chris Pine. Like, oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, that came out a long time ago, <laughs> like six years. Um... Uh, that also just just more of a comment than a question before we move on. I never actually realized until you just said it, Doctor McGrath, what a, what a Star Trek trope that is of them encountering a planet that's Eden, mm -hmm. and then finding out it's it's yeah. like there's something behind it. That is like every third episode of every Star Trek series. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
And one of the movies, too, actually, because they, they land on an Edanic planet in one of the Next Generation mo uh, movies and find out it's not so great. Okay, that's that's my rambling section. Do we have uh, do we have more uh, more questions, uh, Father Tony? I, yeah, yeah, lots. Yeah. Um, <laughs> let's uh, let's talk about Elon Musk, right? So he and it's yeah. not just him, but so, but several um, uh, researchers and other eccentric, interesting dudes have recently been talking about the uh, the theory that maybe this world is in fact a simulation, um, and how the there's math, hand wavy science fiction math to back that up, uh, <laughs> perhaps. Um, and you mentioned that uh, you know any sufficiently advanced uh, society will eventually create simulation, you know, a simulation, simulated life. So there's not really a whole lot of. Um, <clears throat> it, it would be difficult to tell, right, if we were in a simulation, or if not impossible. So uh, I, I think that a lot of these themes are um, just in the air right now. Yeah, and if we could go back to the Matrix, right? One of the things I liked about the Matrix films is that it's possible to interpret them in such a way that, at the very least, they raise the question that we mentioned. Uh, I think it was in the last segment that uh, Jean Baudrillard raises: once you can simulate reality uh, pretty much perfectly, then can you ever know you're in a so-called real world? Yeah. And the question of whether... And does it matter? <laughs> and does it matter, right? Yeah. And the question of whether at the end, the world that Neo is in is a real world, it could be. But then how do you explain the fact that he, in that world, still has this power to do things to uh, the artificial intelligences, the things they uh, derogatorily call squiddies, right? Mm -hmm. They're chasing... He just raises his hand and right. stops them. That doesn't work unless there's this connection. But how could you have that connection in, in the real space, right? So-called real world, yeah. right? Um, and it's he touched the source. Maybe that's just you know the sci-fi you know throw in techno babble and hope people don't ask too many hard questions. <laughs> but but it doesn't another, seem like that kind of movie, right? Another possibility is that it's at least raising the question of could there be another level of reality, mm -hmm. right? And you know, I try, I've tried you know, because of the, of the kind of um, Matrix fan that I am and the kind of sci-fi nerd that I am, I asked myself, you know, what could, you know, if you wanted to write a sequel in which there's another layer of reality, right? Um, you could imagine a story in which right, people have been sent into deep space. It's an interplanetary journey. You can put them into suspended animation so that they won't die uh, before they get there. But the human mind needs something to keep it stimulated. Right, so it doesn't atrophy and doesn't just die. It doesn't just go out of you know, go crazy, and so you put people in a simulation mm. within a simulation, right, with layers to keep them from waking up before the time or something like that, right? And so you could make a whole sequel, you know, or even a whole spin-off TV series where you know each episode you wake in a different layer of reality, and then you get to the next one and the next one. And, Ooh, you should copyright that. Uh, I think it's been. Has it has it not been done at some point? I'm trying to think. Uh, <laughs> I certainly can't copyright it if it's a sequel to The Matrix. Right? No, right. Oh yeah. Well, yeah. something a little a little bit more um, a smaller scope uh, that we um, we mentioned in the break here is uh, the Thirteenth Floor, uh, where that spoiler alert if you haven't seen it, that movie is like 15 years old too. But um, that that movie ends with a twist that there is a simulation within a simulation, uh, and so um, but that one also one of the one of the three movies I talk about most often when I talk to people about Gnosticism. Is, is Dark City the other? Or oh, is shoot, it Pan's four, that's true. No, it I was, was going to say Dark City. <laughs> so what's the Dark one? City, <laughs> that's true, too. Um, yeah, no, it's, uh, well, okay, so I have a bunch of movies. Anyway. <laughs> okay, what's the other one that you were thinking of, though? <laughs> uh, so The Matrix, Pan's Lab, uh, that one, um, uh, gosh, 13th Floor, and um, The Truman Show is the other one. Oh, Truman not Truman science Show. fiction, but, yeah. well, I mean, yeah. kind of science fiction, but not really. Yeah, and of course we can always. Every everything's been done on Star Trek, probably at some point, <laughs> but uh, and Doctor Who, which we mentioned, right? But there are episodes in which you know they find themselves in a simulation, and you know basically have to wake up from it or yeah. you know, figure out it's a simulation first, and then figure out how to wake up from it. Uh, yeah, I would ask the question. You know, if you go to the 
the sort of futurist, um, you know, moving towards singularity type of viewpoint, you know, that um, Musk and Kurzweil and others are associated with, which often explores that possibility of the world being a simulation uh, or being a hologram or being mm -hmm. computationally based at its fundamental level, right? Um, it's really the question of what is reality, yeah. right? I mean, if the world was created through a process that leads to uh, quarks and then the subatomic particles and then atoms and molecules and things like that, and those things are based in energy, uh, or if there's some sort of computational software or hardware that's the basis for this kind of reality. How are those things different mm. fundamentally? Right. right. In both cases, you're dealing with this world being created to have certain features. And if that's what you mean by simulation, then all, all of the monotheistic religious traditions have posited that the world is a simulation mm -hmm. by definition. Right. Um, and so the question of whether what's real means, you know, is it what's tangible? Is it what's ultimate? Right? I mean, because religions also have said, you know, this world is is real in some senses and yet not ultimate. Mm -hmm. Others have said that it's it, what we perceive as, you know, having distinct essences and uh, physicality. All this is, in fact, an illusion and all of reality is one basic thing. All of these intersect with these ideas. And so, again, it's not clear whether bringing computation into the picture, the way some, uh, some futurists do, and I, I'm not sure whether it deserves to be called futurism. I mean, mm. maybe you know, the future aspect is, will we ever figure out whether that's the right. reality? <laughs> but it's a reality that supposedly we're already in. Yeah, currentism. Right? Um, and so what makes it a simulation? Right. I mean, I think that's the key question there. Right? You can't fool me. It's turtles all the way down. So, <laughs> it's turtles. It's software. It's hardware. <laughs> it's um, Brahman. It's you know. I mean, when uh, when you the, the thing that's fascinating, you know, that philosophy, you know, science fiction, theology all intersect on is that, you know, I think ultimately you have to stop somewhere, right? Yeah. And you know, most Star Wars fans would say you stop with the force you know, before you get to the midi chlorians right? <laughs> but sooner or later you come up with an explanation for this thing that cries out for explanation yeah and if you're paying attention you have to ask but where did that come from right yeah and so you never reach a point at which you can reach a point at which your system of thought says this is what's self-explanatory right and it may be a god that simply exists it may be time travel eventually gets invented and then loops around and you have this closed causal loop, which most fans of time travel stories get, you know, literally and figuratively tied up in knots with them. <laughs> find them frustrating. But if the explanation for why we exist is that in the future we'll develop time travel or we'll develop a particle accelerator which creates, uh, creates a singularity that loops around in time and brings our own universe into existence, that wraps everything up nicely. Mm -hmm. Why aren't we satisfied? Why are some people more satisfied with that or with multiverses that somehow just pop into existence than with a creator god, right? Why are some people more satisfied with the creator god than, you know, the time travel? You know? Right. On a practical still, level, nobody has any more proof for one than the other. Well, sooner or later, you have to say something simply exists. Mm -hmm. And... Different theological traditions and different um, science fictional traditions and different philosophical traditions stop in different places, and uh, the 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 adherents of each of those views that you encounter on the internet sometimes will say, and this one is obviously the only rational viewpoint. Right. Uh, but oftentimes, the people who study these things for a living will say, actually, they're different worldviews. And uh, what's more interesting is why do people choose to stop asking the questions? at this point rather than at that point. Mm -hmm. What about it, Neil deGrasse Tyson? <laughs> Why don't you? <laughs> You're welcome to come on the show and talk to us. Yeah. <laughs> get him on. Get him on yeah. if he's willing to be on here. Sure. So, good. <laughs> that would be an awkward conversation. <laughs> anyway, um, let's, uh, let's plug a thing. You, um, you made a card game. Tell us about your card game. Yes. Yeah. And it's the, 
the definitive Gnostic deck is not yet available, but I'm working on it. I've been encouraged. I know people are interested. But one of the things that I talk about at the intersection of religion and science fiction is the concept of canon, right? Uh, because you have debates about canon in science fiction fandom and in religion. Mm -hmm. Are these works in or out, right? And then these works that are derivative, are they in or out? And then what are the boundaries of the canon, right? And fan fiction or midrash, right, are, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. are essentially the same thing, you know, what, where do they stand? Are they extra canonical or inter What happens when you have different groups that end up with different canons, right? What happens if everybody agrees on the canon, but they don't agree on giving all works equal attention or priority, right? So nobody gives foremost attention to the Epistle of Jude in the New Testament, or the postcard of Jude, if you prefer, because it's really... <laughs> right? uh, but some, some groups focus a lot of attention on Acts in 1 Corinthians, Gifts of the Spirit. Some focus on Romans and Galatians and justification by faith. Some focus on Revelation and end times ideas and things like that. Uh, and sometimes they produce works that are supposedly theological, but really are science fiction, uh, like the Left Behind series. Yeah. Uh, but in science fiction fandom, you also have the the issue, right? So is Romans more important than the letter of James? Is a bit like, you know, is the original trilogy more important than the prequels, right? Are the prequels just not canon in the Star Wars universe, according to some people? Uh, what about the you know, the extended cuts in all the franchises, you know, yeah, the, the deleted uh, scenes, cuts, yeah. deleted scenes, right? Um, and so you have the same kinds of questions coming up that come up with, let's say, the story of the woman ca caught in adultery in the Gospel of John. Mm -hmm. If it's not in the original, but it's in the director's cut, <laughs> then, you know, what's the status of that, right? Is that canonical? And so textual criticism can be illustrated from science fiction. And, you know, the and so I was trying to think of a way to boil, boil down the essence of the dynamics of canon formation into an activity that would be fun for students and hopefully also spark discussion. Mm -hmm. And so I created a card game in, in which you essentially have these sort of imaginary slots in the middle and also in front of you, you have your own sort of personal canon that you form. And you have more kinds of cards than you do slots. And you put down cards, either in your own personal canon or in the middle. And the way you score at the end is how well your canon matches the one in the middle. Hmm. And essentially in each move you can put something down or you can take something out uh, to or from your hand. Or you can take something from the draw pile until you have a certain number of cards. And you can discard cards as well. But ultimately there's this collaborative as well as competitive element to the dynamics of canon formation, right? Mm -hmm. Those people that I don't really like, you know, love Jar Jar. And so I'm going to dismiss them and their canon and, or, you know, this person's coming in, it's not George Lucas and, you know, there's only one Pope and, you know, I defer <laughs> him on all things Star Wars. And so JJ Abrams just doesn't cut it or, you know, th these dynamics are, are fascinating, are similar between religion and science fiction. And so, yeah, you can actually go on the, the Game Crafter website, and there's a, a sci-fi fandom deck, and there's a New Testament, and there's an Old Testament Hebrew Bible deck, and eventually there will be a Nag Hammadi deck yeah. and other things. But I found that this actually worked pretty well as a, as a classroom activity, but uh, having produced it using this play-on-demand uh, game, game product, game resource mm -hmm. uh, company... Mm -hmm. I let people know about it, and it's actually been selling quite well. Um, and so, yeah, yeah, it may try and do something with it more formally. But yes, there will be there will be a proper Nagamati deck, at least one. Oh, yeah. And if if people watching your show tell me that they would buy this, uh, I will make multiple decks of this sort. You know, okay. let me know what works you want to be in it, and um, yeah, I can. I can do that. All right. Where do people send their, their cards and letters? <laughs> uh, yeah, to my email address, which is on the Butler website, uh, or you can find it via my blog, uh, or just Google Canon, the card game, and yeah. Uh, yeah, you can find my contact information that way. All right. Let's do it. Talk Gnosis audience. Let's, uh, 
<laughs> let's let's get a whole bunch of them made. Yeah, it is such a cool concept, and uh, I I haven't yet uh, haven't yet had a chance to play it, but I'm looking forward to it. I think that um, I'm definitely going to pick up a couple of decks for our uh, our conclave this year, and and we'll we'll hang out around the campfire and <laughs> and play some cards because that sounds like it'd be right up our alley. <laughs> Okay, well, tell me which works you want in there, right? From you know, from Nagamadi, from elsewhere, you know, and we can, uh, you know, uh, we'll we'll work out so that it's exactly because this is this is a good discussion starter, right? Yeah. Um, I played it with uh, undergrad students who were taking the course as an elective who didn't really talk much about what the card said on them, because they, I made them with um, particularly the New Testament ones with things that one might appeal to as either reasons to include this or exclude it. Mm. In the canon, uh, but I also did a did a a game night at a seminary, and they were just debating what should be and it shouldn't be, and on principle, like, oh, okay. they were doing it as kind of a strategy. I happen to have these cards, and so I'm going to um, try and get this in or get that out. Yeah. So huh. I imagine that your group might have the same conversations. I think so, so I'd, too. I'd love to facilitate that. Yeah, absolutely. That'd be great. Um, all right, uh, we we lost Jonathan. He uh, he's having some internet difficulties, but we'll uh, we'll muscle on without him here. Um, I, I actually uh, one of the questions he put in here was I'm also curious to talk about. Um, we've mentioned a lot of different works that uh, sci-fi sci-fi works that contain Gnostic themes. You know, The Matrix among others. Um, now we know the Wachowskis did have some familiarity with uh, Gnosticism. Um, but a lot of the, uh, the movies that we, movies and, and, and uh, fictional works that we come across that we find Gnostic themes in, a lot of the authors have no knowledge whatever of, of Gnosticism. Um, why do you suppose that is? Is it just in the air and people will latch onto it? Or are these just such universal concepts that they're, they inevitably come up again and again? Um, yeah, I think it's probably all of the above. <laughs> and... I think it's 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 probably you know a combination of things. You know, I, on the one hand, there are Christ figures, which of course yeah. uh, are not exclusive to Gnosticism, but can be, right? But um, redeemer, savior figures, and is that because of some deliberate mimicking of you know Christianity, Gnostic or otherwise, or is it because heroes have these typologies in classic literature? And we still recycle them, right? Just as any show that's been around long enough, and <laughs> a science fiction, you know, can beat out some of them, uh, maybe all of them, right? Doctor Who recently right. fulfilled the years. Star Trek, you know, then came soon after, and you end up recycling and revisiting ideas. You know, there are only so many ideas, <laughs> and that in itself is interesting, right? right. Why do religions represent um, resemble one another so often? Sometimes it's because of deliberate borrowing. Sometimes it's because there are these universal concepts or universal images. Let's see, light. You know, yeah. There's a good one. Let me work light into this and darkness. Hey, you must be borrowing directly from Zoroastrianism, or <laughs> Zoroastrianism must be borrowing from you know, and yeah. uh, not necessarily. You know, it's possible, and sometimes it's indirect, right? So, for instance, there are people who borrow from, say, apocalyptic, and they're influenced by Persian religion indirectly mm -hmm. and so may not know they are being influenced right so you get folks who are borrowing from Philip K. Dick or uh, imitating you want to do the next matrix yeah and don't know the roots behind that matrix or something. right right so they just kind of get it by osmosis <laughs> yeah, so I think there are a number of different ways that uh, it can end up there um, but there are yeah you know, there are a range of possible ways and I'm not sure that yeah, the, the the term alien comes up sometimes in translations of Gnostic texts. Yes. Uh, because you have the figure, for instance, I was involved in this um, project to translate the Mandian Book of John, mm -hmm. and at least once we we use the phrase uh, alien man, right, which also comes up in uh, some other Gnostic traditions, mm -hmm. which itself is interesting how they resemble each other, and at what point were they either the same tradition or sharing ideas or... Uh, but the figure that comes into the world is a stranger, yeah. right? Who's somewhat mysterious because that figure's from up there. Mm -hmm. And really what we're dealing with is the fact that 
whether it's Gnosticism, whether it's Christianity, whether it's Buddhism, whether it's uh, Egyptian things in Stargate, uh, Greek things in Star Trek, and certain. In fact, there, Doctor Who actually beat Star Trek to that. You know, they go back <laughs> to. Um, uh, there's an episode called The Myth Makers where they go back and uh, actually give give the idea for the Trojan horse and stuff like that. <laughs> but ultimately, it's the idea that beings from up there have come down to the world that we live in or will come down to the world that we live in and will make a positive impact, reveal truths to us that we don't know already, right? I mean, those are religious ideas that are important to Gnosticism but are not limited to Gnosticism. Mm -hmm. And they are constantly found throughout science fiction presumably because in science fiction, one of the things I think people are doing, whether they realize it or not, whether they're conscious of it or not, is taking that deep desire to uh, explore our place in the universe and discover that we're not alone because it's inhabited by other humans or uh, non-humans or spiritual beings or angels or whatever and update that tradition of storytelling so that we can continue to explore our place in the universe in relation to beings that might be greater than us. And so what do we do? And what does it tell us about ourselves? And how is it humbling? Uh, how is it revelatory? Mm -hmm. uh, can we get there ourselves? Do we need a savior to at least make us aware of our own potential? Uh, those, those are the fundamental questions uh, that Gnosticism asks, that religion asks. And uh, science fiction is the way that a lot of people ask those questions today. And so I think an important way of asking about those themes is to ask whether even so-called secular science fiction, such as Star Trek, right, where supposedly you have the Enterprise with, you know, it has a chapel for the purpose of weddings, apparently, <laughs> but uh, no chaplain, right, and no outward expression of religiosity by the crew. But Captain Kirk is talking about the attributes of a god from you know, the, the second pilot, right, where, you know, where no man has gone before, they cross the galactic boundary, so it's about crossing these frontiers into this, this world beyond, that's a, a perennial religious theme. Humans are undergo, some humans who have this psi capacity, right, PSI, right, this, mm -hmm. um, you know, psychic uh, ESP, that kind of thing, capacity, which, again, is a major theme in a lot of science fiction, hoping that science would tell us, yes, you do have this capacity for divinity <laughs> yourself, mm. right? So there's another element that is kind of ambiguous, especially now that most scientists would say, yeah, I don't think, uh, I don't <laughs> think evolution's ever going to give us that or crossing the galactic boundary is going to do that. <laughs> but, you know, Gary Mitchell, uh, you know, under, is the first one who uh, starts undergoing these transformations. And later in the episode, Captain Kirk is shouting at him and saying, you know, if nothing else, a god needs compassion. Mm. Captain Kirk is engaging in theology, talking yeah. about the attributes of a god in that episode, right? And this is supposedly secular science fiction. Science fiction, in all its forms, is exploring the things that religion explores. And when you consider the fact that religion, just like science fiction, is kind of like, you know, we know it when we see it, but it's really hard to define in a way that gets everything we want to get in and doesn't leave anything out. Right? Buddhism is the classic example to go to to problematize the category of religions having to do with gods. Mm -hmm. Because you can have uh, versions of Buddhism which either don't do the god thing at all, or at the very least, you know, they're, they're really irrelevant to what Buddhism is about. Yeah. And so, for that very reason, you can have science fiction and acknowledge that it is religious in that broad sense. And then you start noticing these things, and you start noticing that the one religious tradition that you see on the Enterprise in the original series of Star Trek really is Vulcan religion. Mm -hmm. And it's modeled more on Buddhism than anything else, right? And so Star Trek actually did make room for secular religion, in a sense. And that, that in itself is an interesting theme, because, you know, in our time we're discussing not just uh, theological and religious themes in um, science fiction, but also you have, you know, a secularization of um, community and people finding community online, and so church attendance is down, mm -hmm. 
And meanwhile, you have atheists who are starting atheist churches because they're people who are like, you know, we miss the community thing. We don't want the gods and the those things, but we want some elements of that. And so uh, it's a perfect time to be talking about the intersection of um, theology and science fiction because we're actually seeing that you know, the so supposedly sacred, the supposedly secular uh, are not easy to delineate either in theology or in sci-fi or in everyday life in our own time. <laughs> Uh, yeah, well, we're um, we're running out a little short on time, but do you have a few extra minutes? I did want to kind of do this one last question that I think will be interesting. Is everybody good to? Yeah, I am. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> um, you, you mentioned in, uh, in your last uh, in the last question there, you talked about the 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 word alien showing up in in mm -hmm. some of the um, some documents, and, you know, especially in Gnosticism and the Mandean. Uh, the Mandan Book of John. Um, and of course, we all know that Dylan Burns took the best uh, book title in the world, Apocalypse of an Alien God. I think that's kind of... It's it's the best title for either a, 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 a book about Gnosticism or a heavy metal uh, CD. Or so a science fiction other. story, for that or matter. Or a science fiction story. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, <laughs> but um, but let's talk a little bit about aliens. Uh, we, we, you, you alluded to it uh, earlier on in the show, but... Um, we, you know, there's a lot of, uh, well, okay, I say a lot. <laughs> there are some uh, people in organizations who take a pretty, um, I'd say, literalist view of um, uh, alien intervention um, in religion uh, broadly and in, in some, some religions in specific. I'm thinking, you know, uh, ancient aliens who, uh, you know, came down and built the pyramids or Jesus being an alien or any number of uh, other things like that. Um, what, uh, what, where do you think this comes from to uh, read back into these stories, kind of a more literalist, alien, uh, science fiction-y um, uh, bent, I guess? Uh, well, there too, I think there are a number of possible explanations, and I've never really tried to sort of do a, a kind of like a psychoanalysis of like Eric von Däniken and <laughs> like that to say, what, what motivated this identification of, uh, you know, gods of the past as aliens? Uh, it's an interesting question. Um, some of it is, you know, icon iconography where people have found things in uh, ancient scriptures or ancient art or ancient inscriptions that reminded them of uh, technological things, and so that led to that. Um, but uh, there, I'm not sure if that's the cause or if it's people went looking for those things and then lo and behold found them. Yeah, uh, I was I was struck to learn recently that some Mandeans have actually uh, gotten enthusiastic about the ancient aliens thing. Really? Oh, really? Uh, yes. Yeah, so you, if you take a look at, uh, I'm sure you've seen them, but uh, some of your viewers may not have. But you can find some examples of them online if you Google things like Mandean art or Mandean illustrated scrolls or something like that. But the Mandeans have this fascinating and very distinctive artistic tradition. Mm, striking. And it follows yeah. this. Yeah, it's got this very kind of cubist feel to it. Yeah. But you have these beings with these like round heads, and so it's very easy to say, yeah, okay, these beings that come from the light world above with these round heads, you know, maybe those are helmets. And it's, you know, they also it's have personified books. Get there. Yes. <laughs> yeah, right. book men walking around. Yeah. Right. yeah. See, that's them trying to describe a, a robot that has yes. a database in it. So, <laughs> sorry. It, um, it danger, John the Baptist. <laughs> danger. Danger. Right? Danger, I like that. That's great. I've got to work out in somehow. I don't know where it's going to work in. Uh, I will give you credit when I do. But um, yeah, danger, John the Baptist, danger is gonna. It's got to be in some some talk I give at some point or something. Uh, but yeah, the popularity of ancient aliens is puzzling mm. because it's popular even among people who would say it's terrible history. It's not yeah. history. It's pseudo history if you take it as history. Yeah. Right. I don't think most fans of Stargate are watching it to find out what really happened. Yeah. <laughs> Stargate is not a documentary. Right. Yeah. Uh, so why is it so popular? Right. Uh, and so I think on the one hand, the, the, the question of literalism is part of it. Right. I, if you look at the phenomenon of literalism in religion, what we see is that people who accept religion sometimes are very literalistic, but there are people who reject 
the religion, but not the literalism. And they dismiss the <laughs> they dismiss the religion as being as being something that makes literal claims, but they're false. But the possibility that these are stories that are supposed to be more evocative than descriptive, more symbolic than literal, uh, oftentimes doesn't come up, right? And so turning gods into aliens can be a form of anti, supposedly anti-religious polemic, mm -hmm. but then one that backfires, right? Much like, you know, the phenomenon of, of Jesus mythicism says, yeah, we're going to prove Jesus didn't exist and <laughs> makes those who adopt that view really look silly and so ideologically driven that say so how is this better than the religion you're arguing against you know mm. and so finding finding nuance and finding a more scholarly approach right which says yeah we don't think that um ra was an ancient alien because we don't think ra was a real being we feel the same <laughs> about apollo and we don't think that you know we don't think that these things that are described here happened literally right we don't think that jesus walked on water literally and so uh the tractor beam that you're positing as the explanation is not <laughs> necessary right um but if you're going to be literalistic but find that non-scientific accounts of these things are unsatisfactory to you, then one option is to take them literally and look for an alternative quasi-scientific explanation. Mm. And so then you get, you know, you turn to the early chapters of Ezekiel, right? Yeah. Ezekiel chapter one, and there are wheels within wheels and strange things going on in the sky. And it's like, when people see strange things in the sky and they don't know what it is, it's right to call it an unidentified flying object. Yeah. And it's just a short hop from there to, no, it actually is a flying saucer. And uh, the, the being that they saw, the beings that they saw were aliens. Right? And so that's, I think, one of the major ways that people end up there. Uh, and so it's, it's a combination of literalism and often a failure to get what's going on in some ancient iconography and ancient symbolism. So you get these things where uh, one pharaoh came along and sort of plastered over earlier hier hieroglyphics and uh, added their own name, yeah. and the plaster falls off, and the combination of the two, what you end up with, looks like a helicopter, right? There's a famous yeah. example. Mm -hmm. um, or you have you know, someone, you know, it looks like it's, it's supposed to be a book person, but it looks kind of squarish, so it's a robot, right? <laughs> uh, at which point you're wondering, they can reach us from their other planets, but they, they make like... 50s <laughs> special effects robots you know it's kind of you know something well not that's quite. that's something that's that's interesting you mentioned that because i think that a lot of these um interpretations well they de they definitely take on the flavor of the time that they're in you know you have um people seeing call it aerial phenomena in the you know in 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 the Hebrew Old Testament times, they call them angels. It, they see it in the New Testament uh, period. They call it the Marian apparition, uh, and they see it in the 20th century, and they call it aliens. You know, the, there's maybe there is maybe a linear <laughs> uh, progression of uh, of interpretation happening here. Yeah, and somebody that you might actually want to get on your show if you haven't already, uh, and I missed it. Uh, in which case, I very sorry for having done so and say please you know let me i'll, I'll, I'll make it up very quickly because i'll binge watch that um uh jeffrey uh cripple or cripple cripple yeah we haven't had him on yet, yet. Had him on. i didn't think so but I, he'd be an interesting person i think because he explores the intersection between sort of ufology and you know religious experience and those kinds of things and so i think he'd be an interesting person to to interact with but yeah uh, if, you, if you think about the, the the question of um you know coming back to ezekiel right the one that we didn't get to so what is going on there right well if you ask where do you have a divine throne with you know strange creatures with wings and, and faces alongside the throne it's the Ark of the Covenant, mm -hmm. right? And around the time of the Babylonian exile, this thing goes missing, right? And if you've seen Indiana Jones and you know where it ends up, supposedly, <laughs> right? But uh, so Washington D.C., right? Uh, it's in a box uh, along with a lot of other interesting stuff. But that's the imagery, right? And so what Ezekiel sees is a divine presence like the Ark, but which the Babylonians can't steal, and which isn't limited to Jerusalem and can be with people like him who've been carried off in the first wave of exiles to 
Babylon. And if you don't know that sort of imagery, then you'll say, well, it's got to be a flying saucer. Yeah. But uh, there's, a, there's a different background, a mystical. And that text was actually important to Jewish mysticism. Uh, but thinking about the way that the iconography sometimes reflects, right? They came all this way to help us build the pyramids, and yet, you know, what supposedly you see in the hieroglyphics is a, a helicopter, right? Yeah. They can't do more than a helicopter, you know, really? It's uh, the way that the vision of the future reflects the time that produces it is an important aspect of science fiction, and it's also an important aspect of religious texts, right? One of the reasons why certain science fiction stories and certain religious stories go out, get become outmoded and we lose interest in them is because they seem so wedded to the time that produced them that we can't really relate to them anymore. And so one of the things that I got my students to talk about this past semester was the question of you know, whether science fiction is a form of prophecy and prophecy is a form of science fiction and whether either of these really has its value or lacks value depending on how accurately or otherwise it gets the future right mm. or are these things social commentary and they're talking about a vision of the future but what really matters is what they're saying to their contemporaries yeah that's what Cory Doctorow and, says about uh, about his science fiction is you know he's not writing about a plausible future he's writing about a ridiculous present <laughs> yeah yeah and you know I, I got into this debate about um, the science fiction show timeless I don't know if you've been watching that at all. Not yet, no. Time travel show. Yeah. But the, you know, any show involving time travel involves paradoxes. <laughs> but religion often does too. So there you go. Theology often does too. Sure. Um, but on the one hand, you know, does it matter that if you try to take this story literally, you're going to say, but yeah, you know, if that person got in the time machine and then comes back and doesn't remember all these things that happened to that person in this timeline now that history's been changed right didn't that same person right who now is engaged to be married to this other person that they have no recollection of if they came back and found the the people waiting for them that were there when they left then presumably the person that was engaged got into the time machine yeah and traveled back <laughs> and so isn't that a, is that a separate version of them does that create a, a parallel version or does that person merge into the you know yeah. <laughs> it, it all gets entangled and complicated and um yeah yeah i'll make sure that the friend who was saying to me but you know don't you see this as a problem and i was like i just enjoy you know the, the right. show asks interesting questions right <laughs> um yeah about things like creation right um in fact you know one of the the things i don't know if we have time for me to share yeah, some whatever keep going theology yeah, okay. and science fiction <laughs> things but the com the convergence of timeless talking about you know, the, the fact there's this person who worked for Homeland Security who says at one point, I used to worry about, you know, things that could happen to my family, right, terrorism and things like that, you know, gunmen coming after this this agent and wanting to do harm and so harming that person's family. And now the scariest thing that could happen is that they might cease to exist because somebody changes history <laughs> and I won't remember them, Right. And so I was thinking about that, and then I saw the movie Arrival. Yep. Um, which oh, that was raises, such an interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but raises the question, right? Spoiler alert, right? Stop your ears. Seriously, if you haven't seen it, second, right? If you haven't seen it yet, but raises the question of, you know, if you can kind of get a glimpse of the future, do you go willingly on a path that will? You know, basically bring someone into existence or bring a reality into existence that also brings suffering with it, right? And that's the big question about the goodness of the world, right? And the problem of evil, right? And if there is a God who can foresee a cosmos filled with beings who also suffer as a result of bringing that cosmos into existence, on the one hand, bringing that cosmos into existence makes you culpable of all the the suffering, the the genocides, and the war, and the disease, and the ailments, and you know, all these things. On the other hand, what does it mean if you can foresee that, and you can, by acting, bring that about, and you don't? Hmm. Is that different from killing those beings, right? <laughs> As though you went back in time, and they existed in a timeline, and then you brought them you know, out of existence. 
Um, for some religious traditions, reality exists in the mind of God. Mm -hmm. That's what's really real, right? The celestial is really real, and the earth is just a shadow of it. And so if, if you envisage, and this is obviously a highly anthropomorphic view of the divine, but oftentimes you know, that, that's all we've got. You know, it's either that or we refrain from speaking. <laughs> if, you, if you go with that and say, you know, God can envisage this reality, would God not be culpable for basically failing to bring all that joy and meaning and all those things that we, we relish about life, right? Wouldn't it be almost like extinguishing life to not give life that you can foresee and know would have such happiness to it? And so there's a sense in which these shows gave, gave me a different perspective on the problem of evil, mm. uh, even though neither of them was addressing it in a, an explicitly religious way. Very interesting. Well, we could go on and on and on, and, and hopefully we will uh, later on. Yeah. Um, but uh, a, a couple of points. Um, it, it, our um, our friend and fellow podcaster, Miguel Connor, uh, has a show called Aeon Byte Gnostic Radio. I'm sure if our audience, uh, if you watch us, I'm sure you listen to, to him as well. But um, he calls the Gnostics the, uh, the original fan fiction authors. And I don't know if they're the original fan fiction authors, but I, know, I, I certainly get that that's... Uh, it's a good description of what the Gnostics were doing, I think. Um, and, and we've touched upon that a number of times. However, uh, he has interviewed Jeffrey Kripal. So if you go um, to his website, thegodabovegod.com, and you search that out, uh, you can find his interview there, um, which, as I recall, was super fascinating. So, uh, OK, uh, that's it. Anybody want to have any last words before we uh, wrap things up here? Uh, no, it's just it was a, it was a fantastic show, and I'm glad we got through it about talking about Westworld too much, which I haven't seen yet. So oh god, we could go a whole week <laughs> well, on Westworld. <laughs> I haven't I haven't seen it, so I'm I'm gonna have to catch up. Yeah, you have to. Okay, oh, well I'll, I will if you, since you invited me to, I'll say one more thing. A yeah. show that I yes. just started watching season two of Colony. Now see, Colony. I I watched the first couple of episodes of that, and it totally lost me. And I could see how that would happen, uh, but. They bring religion in. Oh, okay. And it gets interesting if you're interested in that sort of thing. So. All right. Um, well, maybe I'll go back. Yeah. Okay. There's there's so much sci-fi. You know, it's it's like the whole canon thing, right? It's you know, there's more than anyone could include in an anthology or you know, yeah. multiple. And so, uh, there's there's more religious literature. There's more interesting stuff to to read, to watch, to contemplate than any of us cl will ever be able to squeeze into this lifetime. <laughs> But what a challenge, though, right? Yep. <laughs> we'll do our best. All right. Well, thank you once again, Dr. McGrath. It was uh, a genuine pleasure to have you back on the show, and we hope that we have you again soon. Um, go visit his blog, which is Religion Prof. You can find it um, by just Googling Religion Prof or James McGrath. And uh, pick up his card game, why don't you? And uh, we look forward to seeing the Nakamati version of that. That ought to be a lot of fun. So thank you very much. We enjoyed, it. We enjoyed this conversation very much. Yeah, thank you. All right, and for those of you listening and watching along at home, we'll see you next week-ish, probably. Bye. Bye.